with Marcelo Chauvet, and I'm the director of the RCA, the Riminai Center for Economic Analysis, and that has the headquarter here in the US. Claudio Moran is the director of the RCA in Europe. So just if you don't know our activities, we organize several conferences, workshops, webinars a year, and we have 14 research groups that are listed on our website. Uh, it's www.rca.world. So these research groups um, organize several events and activities as well. So we invite you guys to go there, have a look in, join and join and participate in our activities. And uh, you can see the schedule, past record slides of most of our conferences at our web pages. So bookmark our website. Um, you, there you can see our scientific committee, fellows, activity, other activities as well. Next week, we're going to have the Global Threats to the World Economy, which is a crowdfunded online conference to support Ukrainian students. It's going to be February 2nd and 3rd, uh, and a lot of activities are coming up soon. So today, we welcome the first RCA panel on predictability in science and society. We have three panelists in discussions on the topic for two hours. I will pass the floor to Paolo Giordani, who will begin the conference. Paolo. Thank you. Uh, it's my pleasure to chair and introduce this panel. So I'm going to spend a few minutes doing just that, introducing the panel. Most economists know how difficult it is to both corroborate and uh, falsify competing theories. Uh, we're told that science is based on testable, reproducible predictions, and this often largely evade us. As a result of these difficulties, economics and other social scientists often have schools and schools of thoughts, and at least in my opinion, an abundance of theories that are designed to fit a very small and slowly changing data set. Can we do better than that? Can physics and uh, philosophy of science help us to do better? Or is physics also running into similar problems as the implications of competing theories become increasingly difficult to test? These are exceptionally difficult topics to discuss, but we also have three exceptionally distinguished panelists to take on the task. Professor Hendry has had a strong influence on time series econometrics. I recall studying on his textbook, Dynamic Econometrics, as a PhD student. And I remember how carefully he was thinking about exogeneity, predictability, causality, particularly in the context of uh, changing parameters. Uh, his experience and understanding of the difficulties in applying statistical methods to economic data is very deep. It's been over 40 years since his seminal econometrics, alchemy or science, in which he wrote that the subject is exceedingly complicated, does not entail that it is hopeless. And maybe that's a, a good moment for today's discussion. Professor Cartwright is one of the most influential philosophers of our time. She started her long career uh, with an interest in mathematics and physics, and later extended her research to the history and philosophy of social, social sciences, particularly of economics. She has also written on modeling, causality, and the policy applications of research, all topics very close to our interest. The philosopher Karl Popper used to say that the greatest compliment he ever received was that the two great scientists, Einstein and Niels Bohr, attended his seminar at Princeton. I don't know if Professor Cartwright feels the same way, but I can tell her that all we had to do to get Professor Rovelli, one of the prominent physicists of our time, to attend today was to tell him 
that you had already accepted to give a talk. <laughs> Professor Rovelli is considered the father of loop quantum gravity theory, an attempt to combine general relativity and quantum mechanics. It's my understanding, my very limited understanding, that this theory is challenging, although not impossible to test empirically. It's also my limited underst understanding that string theory, a partially alternative theory, 50 year old now, is also largely untested. Uh, to give you an idea of how opinionated physicists can be about the relative merits of these theories, and to start in a light-hearted way, I'm going to show you a clip from one of the uh, most popular sitcoms of our time. So I'm going to share screen now, and uh, I'm going to play this for roughly two minutes. Uh, Paolo, I, I believe there is no audio on. Paolo, the audio is off. Sorry? The, was... Uh, there was no audio. We couldn't oh, hear Oh, I'm so Nothing. sorry. <laughs> I don't know what to do for the audio. I don't know what to do now. This was uh, hilarious, but I might abuse your patience by playing it again. Okay. I maybe maybe it. share share the, the YouTube link so that, that uh, everybody can then uh, uh, watch this clip later maybe. i'm go i'm going to do this so this yeah. uh, i don't know why you couldn't hear it it's a segment on loop quantum gravity versus uh, string theory and uh, the two young physicists are having a fight over which theory offers more testable predictions uh, at the end one says well they're both untested can we say that it's not a big deal and move on but uh, it doesn't work uh, that way. So I was going to ask Professor Rovelli if uh, physicists actually can become this contentious when they cannot test uh, their, their theories. I'm sorry that it didn't work out like that. I'm going to share the clip, which uh, I thought was really um, funny. Otherwise, I would not have uh, shown it. The setup is going to be the following now. Uh, each uh, talk will take uh, roughly 25 minutes. I suggest uh, uh, the order David Henry, Carlo Verli, Nancy Cartwright. And then we're going to collect all questions and at the end of uh, everybody's talk. So after everybody is done talking. So with, uh, with this, I'm going to leave the floor to Professor Hendry. Thank you, Carlo. So is this visible? 
screen share? Yes. yes. Fine. Thank you. Right. So predictability forecasting and randomness. When Claudio asked me to talk on this general topic, I thought that I actually had some understanding of predictability. I've ended up concluding I have very little understanding of it, and you'll see that as we evolve. Right, I agree with Carl that predictability and uncertainty play the same role in life science and society. I thought he was going to talk first, so that's why that's there. Predicting and forecasting are often used as synonyms, but predictability is a property intrinsic to the thing that is being predicted, e.g. of a stochastic process in relation to an information set. Whereas far forecasting is a process, you can forecast anything. Predictability is necessary, but not sufficient for forecastability, i.e. that you actually are forecasting something that might happen in the future. We all forecast many things every day, probably unconsciously. But once I'm route to present a seminar on economic forecasting at Norges Bank in Oslo, my taxi driver said, your lectures are pointless. And I responded, well, why are you out this morning? Haven't you forecast finding sufficient customers? And he was actually very good at forecasting when and where to seek trade, which is why he'd ended up picking up me. But, and that required predictable customer behavior, but he'd never thought of what he was doing that way and conceded that perhaps forecasting could be useful after all. Webster suggests predict implies inference from laws of nature, whereas forecast is more probabilistic. We can predict something in the past, so it's certainly not forecasting. From Robert Fitzroy onwards, Weather forecasting has been called weather forecasting, not weather prediction. However, the etymology of forecast suggests connections to gamblers and charlatans. For obviously denotes an advance and is quite innocuous, but we cast dice, we cast lots, we cast spells over people and witches, we cast horoscope, we cast flies in the hope of in rivers to catch fish. It's all very chancy, but we also cast concrete these days. The 30 plus other synonyms are all consistent with that link. In particular, the older a word for forecasting or its synonym, the more dubious its connotations. So those who can do, those who can't forecast, spoke the foresightful Oracle of Delphi when she divined the future to foretell the prophecy by a soothsayer whose premonitions included the expectation that one day a scrying economist would be able to predict the impact of an anticipated economic policy without being a Cassandra. So that's 11 of the uh, 30 plus words in one daft sentence. So the root map, I'll talk about predictability and unpredictability, the unpredictability or otherwise of random numbers, and then look at forecasting the damages from hurricanes, forecasting temperatures after volcanic eruptions, forecasting impacts of tsunamis, look at what's wrong with forecasting. It's one of the key issues is that forecast accuracy measures are not invariant. So two people can claim the same forecasts that are widely different, nevertheless, are the better. Claims of predictability in economics, that picks up a little bit in what Paolo talked about, and then fixing systematic misforecasting and then conclusions and some loose ends. Now, I've tackled this topic quite a few times, and I'm going to begin by defining unpredictability for stochastic processes as being no helpful additional information. In that case, the best prediction is the unconditional mean. If we take the simplest case, yt is an independent normal, uh, that should say sigma squared process. It's unpredictable mean in that the expectation at time t of yt given all the past is the same as the unconditional expectation and that's zero. But unpredictability doesn't mean wild. In particular here, it's predictable in distribution. You can say 99% of outcomes will lie within plus or minus two sigma for that normal distribution. So an unpredictable process could actually be very accurate for small sigma. Conversely, predictability entails relevant information i of t such that e of y t squared is bigger than e of y t squared given i t, and so it implements a variance reduction. Yet yt may be very uncertain if sigma is large in the units of measurement of the variable. So unpredictable things might be very accurate, predictable things might be very inaccurate. Now, in order to get on in statistics, we use sequential factorizations that create martingale difference processes. So we take a massive joint density of all the x's that are highly autocorrelated over time, we can factorize it into the xt today given the past and its parameters, 
times all the previous XTs and keep on going until we get the product of the joint densities of the XTs given their past and their respective parameters. And that creates a Martingale difference sequence epsilon t because epsilon t defined as the x minus the conditional expectation of x given the past has obviously got an expectation of zero. So it's unpredictable from the past and all the available information. And that's enabled statisticians like me for years to treat sequential densities as if they were independent. That is, they sustain laws of large numbers, central limit theorems, etc. But, and it's an enormous but, you need to know the density at each point in time in order to work this out. If you assume strict stationarity as Duke did back in the 1950s, and you just had E of X, then it's simply not true that these conditions hold in a non-stationary process of the kind that we see all the time in the social sciences. And that's because I see three kinds or types or aspects of unpredictability. Intrinsic unpredictability in a known distribution where you can draw random errors, random sampling, conditional information doesn't alter uncertainty, and the unconditional distribution is the best description. Instance unpredictability has kind of become known unknowns. If you've got a fat-tailed distribution, you can get very big outliers at unanticipated times, and these can impose substantial costs like the 2008 financial crisis, but they're relatively transient. And then the worst one is extrinsic unpredictability, which are unknown unknowns. When you get a sudden unanticipated shift of a distribution from location shifts, and these make forecasts very hazardous if you didn't anticipate either the big outlier or the shift of distribution. And this leads economic agents to change their behavior. They try to find better ways of forecasting than you'd normally expect, and they try to seek information to help predict shifts. So if you look at intrinsic unpredictability, here's a standard normal distribution. Most of the observations that you'll draw from it lie between plus or minus three, and you pick one at random, and that's the basis for much of statistical inference. But if we have a fat-tailed distribution, we occasionally get so-called black swans. It's an instance unpredictability. It's quite unlikely you'll get any more of them, even the probability of a fat tail distribution out in the tails isn't that high. And it's certainly extremely unlikely that you'll get a flock of black swans lying out here. This would never happen with independent sampling. Although during the financial crisis, one held, heard idiots in financial markets saying, oh, we've had five, 10 standard deviation draws in a row. This would take a probability of one upon trillions of trillions. How could it happen? Well, the answer is it happens because the distribution shifted. Instead of the rates of return that they've assumed when calculating these as outliers, the rates of return are now down here. And these are perfectly normal draws of extrinsic unpredictability. This is really important because when unanticipated shifts occur and you don't know that they're happening, you can't use the Duke distribution. You cannot prove that conditional expectations based on the current distribution or minimum mean square predictors, a theorem that fills statistics books to the limit, but without stating that they needed strict stationarity to do it. And the law of iterated expectations fails, which refutes many iconic claims. Now, these shifts happen regularly. We've seen so many of them already this century from the financial crisis, the COVID pandemic, the invasion of Ukraine, the energy crisis that follows, et cetera. So was Lehman's 2008 bankruptcy actually unpredictable? Well, it does transpire that the choice of making it go bankrupt depended on beliefs of regulators and their advisors of the consequences. And they wrongly thought the consequences of Lehman Brothers going bankrupt were minor. Now, at the time, in the Monday morning that there were, the bankruptcy was announced, I was having breakfast in my house with Rob Engel, a so-called Nobel Prize winner in financial economics. And Rob agreed, it's minor, it's not a very big agency, nothing much will happen. And I said, I thought it was a disaster. 
on the scale of letting Credit Anstalt go bankrupt in 1931, which brought the Great Depression to Europe. Graham and I both agreed that it was potentially disastrous, and guess what? It was. We would have had the Great Depression other than the intervention of Gordon Brown. So with COVID-19 unpredictable, <coughs> excuse me, epidemiologists expected something like it could happen, but not when or how severe. Some earthquakes seem predictable. Using the movements historically along the North Anatolian Fault, Stein and co-authors predicted in 1997, the large earthquake the Dismet that happened in 1999. Because if you read the paper, they said there was a 12% probability over the next 30 years, which entails, they thought, 88% later than 30 years. <clears throat> Some volcanic eruptions seem partly predictable, as in Super Hills, Volcano, and Montserrat, possibly Mount St. Helens. So what about random numbers? <clears throat> well, deterministic nonlinear dynamic or chaotic processes have decreased in predictability as the horizon lengthens. And most early computer random number generators were pseudorandom from using multiplicative congruential methods like those here, which are nonlinear deterministic algorithms. Nevertheless, they were used widely for simulating stochastic processes. So the extent to which the two differ greatly is unclear. Now, these random numbers are either perfectly predictable or not at all, depending on knowing the formula and knowing the current one to predict the next one. All cycle over their period length, so with enough information, you can get the whole lot and predict each in turn. However, the current period of our computer program, OX, is 2 to the 8,222, uh, 8, which will take you rather a long time to get through them all. Now, it turns out that these random numbers actually had very high dimensional dependencies. And I want to stress that randomness is widely used in cross-section studies to claim independence, i.e. they use random sampling to claim they can factorize the joint density, and that's just wrong. They need much more than random sampling. They need a complete lack of hidden dependence of the kind that we see here in random numbers. Maybe I'll skip the next bit. What about forecasting damages from hurricanes? Well, do good warnings help mitigate the damages? Seven of the top 10 costliest US disasters are this century's hurricanes, a warning about climate change. That's the list of them here. So my ex-student, Andrew Martinez, asked the question, does forecast uncertainty impact the damages that we end up getting from hurricanes? I'm taking this slide partly to illustrate our methods. So we take everything that might affect the damages, the incomes of the population, the size of it, the number of housing units, how often are they hit? Because if they're hit regularly, building regulations might help houses survive hurricanes. Wind speed and pressure, max storm surge, max rainfall. This was done at a time that, that wasn't thought to be really serious, but after Harvey, everyone knows it's serious, but we had it in. Seasonal cycle and energy, soil moisture, air temperature, forecast uncertainty, and 35 other variables that I'm not going to discuss. We then build a database of past hurricanes and we select what matters. Income levels, housing number of housing units, minimum pressure, maximum storm surge, maximum rainfall, and forecast uncertainty are the main variables driving the damages that a hurricane causes. And Andrew has a website where he you can go and see what the damages from Ian were. <clears throat> but for Harvey, this is the uncertainty. This is the official damages. This is his prediction of what they would be from a model estimated two years earlier. But feeding in the numbers about income levels, households, and the uncertainty, because it was quite uncertain that Harvey would sit over Houston for four days. That was not something that anyone anticipated and other models haven't done nearly so well. Now, we've also been working in modeling the recovery in temperature from hurricanes, from volcano eruptions, because we've developed methods in which we can detect volcanoes in the historical temperature record based in dendrochronology. And with one observation, namely 
what has happened when the volcano erupted and the blocking of solar radiation led to the temperature fall, then from one observation, we then can predict the whole of the following cycle up to six or seven periods ahead. And it's pretty accurate. I've picked one, but you can do it for most of the historical volcanoes. And then I've compared that with the kind of methods that had been used, autoregressions. And autoregressions actually go completely the wrong way. And we'll come back to that later in the talk. If you want to forecast accuracy, accurately don't use them. What about the unpredictability of tsunamis? <clears throat> so let's look at the 2004 Indian Ocean Boxing Day tsunami. That certainly the undersea earthquake of Sumatra was not predicted. It was potentially predictable, but with a very wide margin of timing. Now, there's no relevant information at the time to predict the earthquake, but once the tsunami started, advanced warning was perfectly feasible. In a paper written a couple of years later, it turns out that a satellite had actually recorded distress tension, tension and its release in real time. And so everybody who might have been affected more than an hour away, for example, so actually couldn't have been, it was too close to the tsunami. But this was not noted at the time. The forecasting models built in the way Hawaii keeps getting hit by tsunamis make the timing and location of impacts very predictable once you know they've started. The models selected based on the physical theory of tsunamis and they're calibrated once tsunami warning systems are in place. And then the uncertainty lies within fairly small intervals. And I'm glad to say the whole of the Indian Ocean now has a cluster of satellites recording any likely tsunamis. <clears throat> Let's come back to forecasting and economics. Now, take the simplest autoregressive process. The random errors are independent, normal, constant variance. Mud rows less than one, so it's a stationed, strictly stationary and weakly stationary process. I'm going to take the same model, but express it in two different ways. So model one coincides with the DGP, and I'm taking rho is known, so there's no estimation problem here. So yt is forecast by rho yt minus one plus ut. Model two is widely used in America. They take delta yt. Now delta yt is just rho minus one, yt minus one plus ut. It's still the data generation process, but you're forecasting the change in y rather than the level in y. And if you look at the conditional mean square forecast errors. For one step, these two give exactly the same forecasts, but for two steps, they do not. They give quite different forecasts. So if rho was quite close to one, then forecasting the change gives you an apparently much smaller forecast error of just sigma squared u, whereas the level gives you nearly two sigma squared u. So they're the same. I mean, it's just a linear transformation of a model. It's invariant under linear transformations, but its forecasts, multi-periods ahead, are not. Now, let me take this to a ridiculous level. Here we're forecasting the level of a process just in the red line, and there are two forecasters. One misestimated where the data were at the time of the start, and that's the blue line, and the other just forecasts the mean, and that's the green line. Now, I've drawn it such that every forecast of B is closer to the outcome than any forecast of A, the corresponding forecast of A. So clearly B wins. However, if we forecast the changes, model A has got the average change correct, model B is quite wrong, so it's got a vastly bigger forecast mean square error than A. And worse still, if we now accumulate their forecasts, so we accumulate the changes for A, it's extremely accurate, but that for B is not. And this explains why intercept corrections, where you just, for the first forecast, you take the error and you move the blue line up to the middle of the red line and then forecast into the future. And this explains why non-causal variables can win in forecasting competitions you can get a really good model of the economy. It looks as though it's forecasting extremely well. And someone comes along with a model that is no causal variables and it can win in forecasting. And this dates back to the origins of forecast competitions in the 1960s. So what about Friedman's predictability? Money is 
the only and always cause of inflation. Well, Friedman kind of bases it on the stock of money times its velocity of circulation equals the price level times real transactions, MB equals PT, a very famous one. And this certainly holds for hyperinflations. If M rises to the power 20, you'll get P rising to the power 20, as V and T simply cannot change much. But it's not at all general. And indeed, to prove his claim, Friedman actually adjusted US velocity down by more than 50%, as in panel A. So this is the actual velocity of circulation from 1860 to 1970, which is Friedman's data sample. But this is what he used. Right, so these are logs. This is log five and a half. This is log two, nearly just under three. So it's a massive change in order to prove that velocity was relatively constant because it sure ain't constant over the whole period. Now in the UK, there's very little relationship between money and inflation, although there are lots of monitors still out there claiming, oh, the increase in money causes inflation. And I've highlighted the massive difference between them from 1980 right through to the present day. Money doesn't. So I say that refutes Friedman's claim, but Friedman claims that by doing this adjustment, he proves it. So this is roughly the problem Powell raised at the beginning. So what about systematic misforecasting? Well, we're going to do the same thing here. This is the Office of Budget Responsibility. This is Britain's productivity up until the financial crisis of 2008, then drops dramatically, recovers, and then grows at a much slower rate for the next, the remainder of the period. And these are the forecasts. Now the pur purple dotted lines are the actual data measured at the time. And these forecasts you can see are roughly parallel to where it had been. So the, the Office of Budget Responsibility is clearly using a model like the AR1 that imposes the same mean all the time. And that mean is now completely wrong. But notice, this is 2009 to 2020. They've made no effort to correct the fact that their forecasts are always wildly wrong. And this is one of the reasons that forecasting in economics is so bad. Forecasters persist in believing their model rather than taking their appalling forecasts as evidence, there's something wrong with it. So we use what we call forecasting devices. This is a smooth, robust forecasting device, and it's forecasting over the same real-time data as OBR had over five years into the future, and you can see it's vastly more accurate than their model. So, some conclusions. Unpredictability means an economist's job is never easy. I don't blame the OBR. Initially, at least, it's sensible to think we'll get back on track. And so John Mason, criticizing my paper to the Royal Society in 1986, said, well, as the weather forecast has no effect on the weather, the economic forecast may often affect the economy, which I completely agreed with and didn't think it was a fantastic, fantastically devastating critique. You can prove fixed point zero. But a crisis raises a paradox. It's an extreme event, but they've occurred frequently this century. So on Monday, you go to your garage and the mechanic says, you will crash if your brakes are not fixed. Driver, better fix them. Wednesday, back at the garage. Why did you change my brake pads? Today's emergency stop was fine. Now, of course, that seems ridiculous, but if we're a policy agency and we alter policy, having forecast that a crisis will happen, we actually get the same forecast failure. The crisis doesn't happen. And central banks are at a real effort to emphasize the conditional nature of what they do. We averted a recession by lowering interest rates. They forecast a recession and then they averted it. This is the paradox that adds to all the problems in forecasting and economics. If we fail to forecast some crises, as we did with the 2008 and all the other ones this century, and we avert some that we do forecast, so it looks as though they never were correct forecasts because they didn't actually happen, that will overwhelm successful predictions that occur from any agency. So it's nearly impossible to evaluate how well agencies are doing when they actually are able to change policy exactly as Sir John Mason said, in order to change the economy. So in the end, I don't know what predictability is. <laughs> 
how far ahead is predictable. It can be vague, we can predict there's another pandemic in the next decade. That's probably certain, is it terribly helpful? Well, a little bit, because you could actually do better than our idiot government in Britain by actually preparing for a pandemic. How do we evaluate correctly falsified forecasts that the car breaks or what's happening with climate, right? If we intervene to reduce CO2 emissions, the climate change along business as usual will not happen. What if the conditioning information is actually false? You didn't realize that you'd been given completely wrong information. There's also the problem that unconditional forecasts can fail. The claim that this summer will be warmer than last winter was actually falsified in 1816 after Tambora erupted and created a year without a summer where it snowed in New Haven in July of 1816, right? And indeed, there's quite a large number of deaths. Sadly, of course, it's the year after the end of the Napoleonic Wars. So Europe was already in a shambles before Tambora created hugely cold winters, uh, cold summers, sorry, and crops failed. And do unpredictable shifts of distribution make the analysis circular? I showed you the do <clears throat> decomposition to get unpredictable errors, but I needed to know that the shifts of distributions were predictable. So if they shift unpredictably, are we going round in circles? Thank you. Thank you. So uh, Professor Hendry is by all measures an expert in predictability, but uh, he concludes that he doesn't know what predictability is. Um, I thought I knew what time it was, and then uh, I listened to Professor Rovelli's uh, talks in recent days, and now I am confused about what time is. <laughs> Apparently, it doesn't exist. Um, I will leave the floor uh, to him now. Okay, thank you, um, Paolo, and thank everybody for um, being here and and uh, uh, and uh, uh, listening. It's a honor to be in a panel uh, like this. Um, David just talked um, before me. Um, David is a, a talks about economy, which seems to be um, the train where it's harder um, uh, forecasted because predictability is so complex. Uh, I talk as a physicist, uh, um, and I'm going to talk about predictability in in, uh, in physics uh, in a domain where it is said um, predictability is what physics is about. Um, and yet, what I want to say, and that's going to be my main message, is that there is something very paradoxical, paradoxical about predictability in physics. Because, yes, on the one hand, uh, um, one may say, perhaps exaggerating a bit, that uh, predictability is the core of the story of physics. Um, what am I saying that physics is, uh, it's, it's, uh, um, uh, it's, uh, it's all about predictability. To have equations that predict what is going to happen is the aim of physics. And not only that, but physics has been very successful uh, in this. In fact, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a claim of glory of, of, uh, of physics. Um, the very fact that uh, long-term predictions are possible, which is something that emerged uh, uh, already in ancient uh, uh, astronomy, which was the historical root of uh, uh, modern physics, and then was taken down from heavens to earth uh, by Galileo and then Newton, is what grants um, uh, the science we call uh, physics. Now, it isn't more than this. Predictions... Uh, one might say, uh, at least in some uh, areas of philosophy of science, that um, are not only the aim of physics, but actually the only goodie that physics truly uh, delivers. Because uh, you know, uh, finding out the true ontology or anything like that uh, might be uh, far more uncertain. Uh, but predictions are what, what is the solid part of physics. And even more than that, as Paolo was um, saying in, uh, uh, in opening, predictions are the tool of the trade because, uh, um, as David said at the beginning of his talk also, uh, it's uh, 
thanks to predictions that uh, physics uh, uh, selects uh, its own theories, uh, recognizes its own theories via falsification or corroboration of uh, good predictions. This is this way that uh, theories get established. And Powell, of course, started by, by mentioning the case of strings and loop, which is not established physics yet. It's, 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 it's exactly the ongoing debate where uh, everybody agrees uh, it has to be settled at some point thanks to prediction, verified predictions or falsified predictions. So one is tempted from all that, that uh, to conclude that, all right, so nature is predictable. Of course it's predictable. That's show, showing all that. And physics is uh, perhaps just a component of our successful way to latch on on this predictability. That's one hand. Now, on the other hand, um, this uh, sort of rosy picture finds remarkable limits within physics itself. Uh, nature, I want to claim strongly, is not predictable in a very concrete sense. And in fact, in a, uh, in a number of very concrete senses, uh, uh, which are uh, ingrained in the in the in the structure in the very structure of physical theories. Um, let me mention a few of these, and uh, let me start from Newton mechanics, uh, uh, which has long been the, the you know the prototype of successful uh, science. It still is prototype of successful um, physics in its own domain. Now, for Newton mechanics, everybody has in mind. Uh, uh, and uh, is often repeated Laplace's famous formulation of uh, uh, determinism, which is in his uh, uh, philosophical essay on probabilities. So let me uh, let me just uh, quote it exactly because uh, I think it's it's interesting to uh, to reflect a moment what exactly is being said in this famous quote. I'm reading it. It's just three lines. Laplace says, "An intellect, which." At a certain moment, would know all forces that set nature in motion and all positions of all atoms of which nature is composed. If this intellect were also vast enough to submit this data to analysis, it would embrace in a single formula the movement of the greatest body of the universe and those of the teeniest atom. For such an intellect, nothing would be uncertain. And the future, just like the past, will be present before its eyes. Full predictability is granted. So one is tempted to read, OK, Laplace is saying that nature is fully predictable. But actually, this is taking the blueprint of predictability. But actually, read carefully what Laplace is saying. He's saying exactly the opposite. He's saying that nature is not predictable, right? Because the statement is an hypothetical, OK, whose premise is false. So um, what the statement implies is that if you want, if you, if you, if you want to predict everything that's going to happen from the large bodies to the teeny atoms, what you need is two things. First, knowledge of all the single positions of everything, which we certainly not don't have. And that's not, not, not sufficient. Um, you would also need, uh, as Laplace says, an intellect vast enough to submit this uh, that analysis or a capacity of, uh, uh, of calculation, if you want, that we certainly don't have. And not even the, you know, the most advanced, the quantum computers that our politicians dream will, 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 will get. Uh, they can dream. I'm sorry for them. Uh, even with those, we would certainly not be able to do this, uh, this calculation. So what Laplace is saying is that we cannot make predictions because we don't have all this information and we don't have all this um, capacity. And so natural is not predictable. And in other words, Newtonian mechanics taken seriously a la Laplace in the Laplace story does not point toward telling us that the world is predictable. It actually points toward telling us that the world is unpredictable. Okay. Um, I'm going to come back in, in a moment on that in, 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 more in detail, but there's more, or even corners of physics. Um, one is special relativity. Now, special relativity is perfectly established piece, uh, part of current understanding of the world, is solid science. And what special relativity tell us that if I want to predict what's going to happen um, one minute in the future, okay, the data I need for doing this prediction are uh, in the past light cone, in the past uh, uh, of that future moment, okay? But part of those data are outside the past of my own, um, uh, my own past. 
and therefore are not acceptable, acce uh, accessible to me as a matter of principle. Which means that according to special relativity, I here locate in space time as a matter of principle cannot predict the future. Okay, impossible according to our best understanding of the structure of space time. Now there's more, uh, which everybody knows. Quant quantum phenomena, uh, quantum quantum phenomena discovered at the beginning of last century, um, has have led to a amelioration of Newtonian mechanics, which is quantum mechanics, and according to quantum mechanics, um, uh, uh, the best we can do is not to make predictions, but give the, the, uh, uh, calculate probabilities of, of something, what may happen in the future. So at best, we can give probabilistic predictions. And there's more, even more, last uh, fourth point. Uh, among the sort of vast zoology of de facto impredictable phenomena in nature, it is ourselves, right? So much so that we happily uh, like to consider ourselves free agents, which means unpredictable machines. That's what free agents mean. So um, even so, mu so much so that even if we uh, are told what we're going to do, we very opposite feel that we can do the opposite of what we are predicted to do to do and very much enjoy this now this uh, careful this is subtle we when we ponder our choices am i going to do this or i'm going to do that um we do so we can do so on the assumption that by itself the future is not predictable because if somebody had already predicted there would be no point in pondering a choice Okay. Now, of course, this does not contradict Laplace at all, because if somebody else, knowing me enough, uh, could predict the outcome of my own pondering, that would not neither contradict Laplace's picture nor my own assumption that I cannot make a prediction, and that's why I'm going to the pondering. But this does contradict the fact that, as we ourselves are concerned, uh, the in, in our pondering, in our making decision, we're assuming that there's an unpredictability in the, in, in the future. So if I bring all this together, according to our current best understanding of the world in physics, nature is not predictable by us for at least four, on four different grounds, completely different grounds. First, because we're limited creatures, and so um, there's no way we can have enough data for making a prediction. Uh, and enough computational power for doing the prediction. Second, because of special relativity, things can come out from infinity fast enough. Third, because of quantum mechanics, there is really randomness in nature as far as we understand. And fourth, because we ourselves, the way we think, um, the very idea that we make choices are required that we think in terms of predictability in the future. Now, before going ahead, let me just say that I'm a physicist, but I do like to talk to uh, uh, philosophers and some of the ideas have been strongly influenced by a uh, conversation with a number of philosophers, which I know mostly appreciate and respect. I want to make, men mention two of them. One is Janan Ismael, um, who has uh, a lot talked about the role of ourselves as uh, 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 located agents in the, in, in, in the universe when we think about the future. And uh, the second is Wayne Marrow, um, who has uh, um, uh, um, uh, influenced my, uh, me a lot in understanding the role of uh, uh, the relation between microphysics and microphysics. I'm going to come back on that. All right, so all this seems to point that uh, predictability is very hard, period. And so is physics telling us forget predictability? Well, of course not, because we do make predictions, okay? And we do make successful predictions. It is a fact that we make good predictions uh, with physics. So how the hell do we do that, given that physics seems to tell us it is impossible, okay? I think this is a very well-posed question. And I am not sure we really know the full answer. I think we, we know a lot of pieces of this answer. We can give pieces of, of, uh, of uh, 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 the story, why we can make prediction in spite of physics. Um, but I'm not sure we have the full story. Let me dig into, uh, into this a little bit and, and, and show 
that the art of predictions within science is far more subtle than what may be given for a sort of a naive philosophy of science or for a one war one uh, classical mechanic course at the university. Take one prediction. The first, uh, uh, the one I mentioned, the first uh, extraordinarily successful predictions uh, about astronomy in ancient um, uh, Alexandrine uh, astronomy. Today, you can you can take the book of Ptolemy, open it up. It's you know, easy to find. Study it and use it to predict the position of Venus in the star in the sky uh, today or tomorrow. And bingo, you get it right. Okay. So this is astonishing, right? The book was written 2000 years ago. So 2000 years ago, somebody had tools for predicting the exact position of Venus in the sky 2000 years in the future, okay? Forget Nostradamus. I mean, David was very envious of this the world for him was, uh, was like that. This is possible. So it is a, there is a, this real mind blowing capacity of reading into nature and predict uh, and uh, uh, predict the future. Now, what is this about? Venus is a bright little dot in the morning uh, sky or in the evening uh, sky. From the perspective of modern physics, from the knowledge of modern physics, Venus is a big uh, world, right? Sort of the size of the Earth, a little bit uh, smaller, which is formed by mountains and uh, rocks and winds and heat and all sort of uh, stuff going on there. It's very is a hell, Venus. Um, and all that is made by little atoms, which are smashing against one another and doing things. And let's not dig further than the atoms. It's a, it's a complicated matter. So Laplace tells us that if we knew the position of each single atom of Venus, uh, we could predict what happened. But of course, we don't know the single atom. It's more than that. If on the basis of uh, uh, our knowledge, current knowledge of Venus, Okay, we consider possible position of the single atoms, and we think what this could lead. lead we have enough uh, understanding um, for computing that everything could happen in the future. Venus could explode. Venus could dissipate in a cloud uh, of dust, which is certainly compatible with the uh, equation of physics, given the equation of physics is a time reversal invariant, and Venus we know was in a cloud of dust in the past. So that possible evolution of the state of, uh, um, uh, of, uh, uh, of Venus. Um, now, Venus doesn't do that. So what's going on? You might read in textbooks that what's going on is that, well, of course, on the basis of what we know, um, everything is possible in Venus microphysics, but some things are more probable, some things are less probable, and we can use statistics and uh, mm, uh, uh, figure out that the majority of microstates would evolve in a way that make Venus stable. Well, that's sort of correct, but it's, it's certainly also wrong because uh, um, if so, if this was a logic, you could use this logic backward and conclude that Venus never was a cloud of dust because the majority of state compatible with what you see today, if you roll backward, don't become a cloud of dust, okay? Uh, so there's something wrong in the logic. Um, so what I'm saying here is that, I, I mean, I could go on and discuss these things in, 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 in more detail, but what I'm saying here is that the story of what is predictable and how is far more complicated uh, then it has nothing to do almost or very little to do with Laplace story. It's not Laplace story, it's something else. So let's take Venus again and uh, let's look at it in, in a better way, not from the microphysics, but from the top, okay? Uh, from the observable. And the, the simplest observable of Venus accessible 2000 years ago is just, you know, a, a bright dot in the sky and the altitude on the sky, okay? And that observable, turn out that behaves for reasons that, as I said, in part we understand stability, in part we don't because time reversal, but that observable does behave in a predictable way, okay? It does follow a simple, a very simple um, uh, story. This is a fact. Now, it might seem incredibly a strike of luck that about Venus, we access uh, of, of the zillions of variables of Venus, we access a collective variable that happens to behave in a predictable way. Are we so lucky? Of course, it's the other way around, okay? It is precisely 
because in that special case, we are in the fortunate situation where a combination of accidental facts have put us in the situation of having access to a, to a very complicated phenomenolo phenomenology, Venus, via a simple variable that happens to behave in a predictable way. It is precisely because of that, that humankind has been able two millennia ago already to recognize an instance of a possibility of long-term predictability. So once this is understood, it seems to me, the rest is just the same. Predictability in physics is not Laplace's story. It is very similar to the predictability, and thanks David for mentioning a phrase of mine at the beginning of your talk, um, which is exactly where I'm going now. Predictability in physics is very similar to predictability in common life, in the social sciences, in medicine, or I, 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 I imagine in, 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 in economics. We are in front, in fact, we're not in front, but we are part of a very complex and fully unpredictable nature, okay? And uh, of the extraordinary large number of variables that might describe nature's way, um, we do not access that a small subset, an infinitely small subset. And among these, which is still very large, this is minimal compared to what's going on. I mean, the, the, the data we have are uh, an extraordinarily small uh, subset of the relevant data out there that interact with the dynamics. But among this, 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 uh, this, this variable that we access, uh, with patience, a cumin, intelligence, um, and a lot of luck, we might be able to find some variables that, for reasons that we in part understand, and it's good, this effort of understanding, in part we don't understand, behave in a predictable way. And once we find them, um, we, uh, we use the, uh, let me say, behave in a, regular, in a sufficiently regular way with sufficient regularities that allows us to make predictions, and therefore they are predictable. Therefore, they have the property that David called predictability. So predictions involve a complicated working of finding out specific variables that behave decently in the vast uh, uh, wavy ocean of, uh, uh, of nature's variables that for some reason intuitively are sufficiently sort of screened off um, from the ocean of disturbances that a priori would make any prediction impossible. And I don't think that we have in science, um, we have pieces and bits of it, a theory that a priori tell us um, which one are the, uh, the predictable variables, except in cases where well, we know, I mean, if we have many similar variables and sufficient symmetry, we have a lot of theorems, uh, you know, a uh, 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 large number of theorems and similar that helps us in finding out the, the, the average of many similar variables is certainly more, predict more predictable than individual variables and so on and so forth. But in general, it's in, in, a, in, in a theory which is described by complex nonlinear um, equations and interactions which, which cannot solve, uh, we don't have a tool, um, a tool for that. Um, so it's it's an art uh, going through nature and finding out the pieces that uh, um, happen to behave sufficiently screened off for the rest, or sufficient or, or where the rest is sufficiently cancel itself out to allow us uh, predictability. Now, last point, super brief. We are pretty good in finding these variables. Okay, uh, we are pretty good both um, individually because. I know what's going to happen tomorrow morning. The sun's going to rise, okay? And I know uh, that this will fall, and I know a lot of stuff. I can make predictions. And much more, uh, we're good collectively, because collectively, we have put out science and the lesson in astronomy and, and modern science and Newton equation and all that. So we're good in this game of selecting variables. that. Um, and why are we good at that? This is something we understand. Okay, because we are a product of evolution, and obviously this skill in recognizing predictable variables, it's part of the skills that evolution has gifted us in order to, uh, for us to, uh, to survive. That's what I wanted to say about predictability insights. Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, I oh, good that you're there. <laughs> then, uh, well, my job is uh, too easy. Everybody's uh, finishing in in perfect time. That's great. We'll have some time for debate. So I leave the digital floor to Professor Cartwright. I'm trying to share my screen. Uh, do you see it? Yes, it's fine. Thank you. Okay, and then we want to do... Um, so I think I should start with a number of introductory remarks to locate uh, what I'm doing today in the, the broader scheme of predicting in science and society. So the first thing to note is that what I'm going to talk about now is predicting in society um, and not really predicting inside uh, uh, science. And um, we started, uh, Paolo talked about uh, using predictions to test theory. Well, I'm not um, going to talk about using predictions to test theory. I'm rather interested in using theory to, um, to provide predictions for us. Right? So I'm not interested in testing theory, but in using it. And I'm not just interested in theory in the sense of the kind of high theory um, that Carlo was talking about, or um, even you know, kind of high theory in economics. I'm really going to talk about how you use quite low theory, um, just principles that you express as generics, like people respond to incentives um, uh, in, uh, in making predictions in society and real cases. Now, we also had, uh, <clears throat> I think, um, that David cited Webster saying that prediction is inference from laws. Okay. Now, um, am I going to use that sense of prediction? Well, yes, but really no, uh, not in the way it's usually thought about, where um, somehow or other the prediction follows fairly straightforwardly from a single set of kind of a unified set of laws and a unified theory. Um, I think that we do need laws in the sense of these low level causal principles. Um, we do use them all the time to make predictions in society, um, but we have to cobble together uh, principles from a variety, large variety of different places. So we're actually using principles in a quite different way than for instance, I was taught you know, to use um, a, th a quantum theory to make uh, predictions about what might happen um, in a laser. Um, now, the, um, so really I'm looking at cases where we're trying to make a prediction where unlike, <clears throat> unlike uh, David's taxi driver. So I'm interested where, where I've been working lately. Um, and I think it's very much like ordinary social reasoning and ordinary reasoning day to day is predicting what will happen when you act. And I've been looking at social policy and interventions in social policy and predicting what will happen if we implement a policy here. And the idea is that generally these are new policies that we don't have any regularities about. It's not like, you know, we have, a, 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 you know, pro with high probability, um, across a large data set that the policy will result in fewer teenage pregnancies. Um, it's a new policy or it's been tried in one or two other places. Um, so we're predicting something uh, new. And even if it's uh, a policy that has been tried out a couple of handful of other places, uh, it's always different when it's implemented in a new place. Not only are new places very different, but it's always different when implemented in a new place. So I'm really interested in how in the ordinary ways in which we um, provide, uh, provide these predictions. But moreover, I'm sort of interested in the philosophical question of, we do make these predictions all the time. Some of them are pretty good. Some of them are borne out. And we argue for them. We provide reasons for them um, and evidence for them. Um, and uh, so my project started with actually making a catalog of the kinds of evidence that um, are generally used for making these causal predictions. Actually, the project began with looking at um, both 
ex ante prediction and post hoc evaluation. I mean, did the policy actually pro produce the effect it, um, it was intended to? So um, what I've done is I've truncated uh, my table that I'm going to show you uh, to only get uh, evidence that would be available before the fact. Uh, but the, the, there's a much larger table of how you might evidence these causal claims after the fact. So I'm, I'm in, so one of the things I'm interested in is how do we, what kind of arguments, evidence do we present for these causal predictions, uh, which are in the single case? I mean, here now I'm going to implement this policy. I want to know what it's going to do. Um, <clears throat> but I'm also interested in the philosophical question of um, why is this evidence? I mean, there's a lot of stuff we present as evidence and um, it would be nice to understand, um, have a, 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 a a view about what makes it evidence. So my topic is how to provide evidence for predictions about the effects of interventions. Like, will this intervention do what you want it to do if you implement it here in the way you're going to implement it? And the philosophers, uh, for philosophy speak, this is singular causal predictions. It's not causal regularities or what we call generic uh, causal claims. We're interested in a single claim about prediction about this case. Uh, now, can we have evidence, good evidence, for causal prediction in the single case? Uh, will this reading program help the pupils in my class? Uh, and the answer is yes. Uh, this is a catalog of the kinds of evidence that I think we can provide um, for singular causal predictions. As I said, it's a truncated one that uh, has many, many more uh, uh, slots in it if you are doing post hoc evaluation. Okay, so uh, let me tell you about the opposition to my claims and what my plan is. So the opposition claims that you must establish a counterfactual to establish a singular causal claim. So you must establish what would happen if the, uh, the reading program were adopted versus what would happen if the reading program were not adopted. Um, this is one of the great advocates of evidence-based medicine. Um, he says the need to compare like with like uh, has been recognized forever. So you have to compare, you know, what would have happened and exact what would happen in exactly the conditions we're in now if we implement it, what is what would happen if we can't don't implement it. And um, so skeptics, and this is for instance, um, traumas and others in evidence-based medicine and now in evidence-based social policy, and in particular, it's swept development economics, say that you must establish a counterfactual to establish a singular claim. And then they say, well, you can't do that. You can't actually establish a counterfactual about the singular claim. Even post hoc, you know, you can either implement the policy or not, and you can't ever directly test what would happen uh, or would, would have happened um, if you've done the other. So I aim to the contrary to describe non counterfactual evidence types and then to show why they are evidence for singular causal prediction. And the stuff I'm going to do is really simple. Um, uh, but what I want to do, because I, there, there, there is this um, the opposition claim, right, is that you can't really do this. Um, you can't find evidence for singular uh, causal claim, singular causal predictions um, that involves having evidence about a counterfactual. Um, and it's not that they claim you can't do it. They think there's one way to do it, which is the way I was referring to when I was talking about the usual way one thinks of using laws for prediction. They want to establish a regularity, right, a kind of general causal claim uh, that this kind of intervention has this kind of effects almost always or almost always across a certain set of kinds of cases. So they want to establish the regularity and then from the regularity just infer, well, if it happens almost always in this kind of case, um, it'll happen here. Right? So that's a very, um, uh, uh, they, so it requires that there be a regular connection between the putative cause and the putative effect. Um, now, um, I'm looking at cases where um, there the no such regularity has been established. Now, very often the people who um, advocate this um, 
uh, want to use randomized controlled trials to establish what happens in one in, in one setting or another or another. Uh, maybe they think if they do, you actually see if they do three or four really good ones, um, the what works centers in both the US and the UK and increasingly elsewhere, um, they actually evaluate the evidence and they tell you, look, the best way to decide whether this is gonna work in your school is to look to see that it works everywhere in schools like yours where the everywhere has been established by a handful of um, you know, places that it has been seen to work using the highest standard of evidence they think, which is a randomized controlled trial. That's why I'm, talking about randomized controlled trials is the alternative way to, to do this kind of thing is generally, I think, to make a bad induction. It's worked three or four or five times, two times, one time. And so we assume it generally works everywhere and then do a, a deduction to it'll work here. Um, so I want to use the same device that randomized controlled trials use um, to, uh, to, uh, to establish causal claims. Um, but I'm going to use it to show that my non-counterfactual evidence types really are evidence types. And that's to use uh, potential outcome equations and simply to generalize them to something all I call singular causal equation models that look very much like uh, stuff that Herbert Simon was doing quite a long time ago. Um, and the point about it is that it, uh, schemes show why evidence in my chart is evidence. So what justifies that RCTs estimate treatment effects? Okay, um, I'm just gonna do this very quickly, just to explain why I'm introducing a potential outcome equation. You start with potential outcome equation. Y is the outcome, uh, X is the, the treatment of interest, um, and W is gathers together all the other things that might operate independently of the treatment of interest uh, to produce the outcome. And that C equals is to say that this is an asymmetric relation. It's not just an equality, um, a regime of change, but on the right-hand side, um, we are listing the, the real possible causes. Now, if you suppose orthogonality, so in a randomized controlled trial, what you're aiming for is orthogonality. You have a treatment group and a control group. You suppose orthogonality in the study population, that the other causes um, are independent of whether you get the treatment or not. And if you suppose orthogonality, then you can show that the expectation of this beta factor is the um, difference between the expectation. Uh, you can prove this, what's written there. So the difference in observed mean outcomes is an unbiased estimate of the study population average treatment effect. So because beta is the beta of I is the treatment effect. If, tell, if you put in X equals one versus X equals zero, hold fixed everything else, um, then uh, beta is the treatment effect on the individual. And what we're doing here is getting its expectations. So what we're getting is the average treatment effect. Okay, now, potential outcome equations and singular causation. Potential outcome equations suppose that for an individual, an individual case like my school, my class right now, um, for I, there's a set of causal possibilities about what can contribute to the outcome, uh, whether or not we can figure these out, but it's, it's a metaphysical assumption that there are in the set, in the situation, a, a set of, a, a fact about the set of uh, causal possibilities. So it supposes actually a set of singular causal truths because those are all about this individual case. Then they use this to show that you can get an unbiased estimate of the population average treatment effect in an RCT. So they start out by assuming um, this, um, these facts about singular causation. Uh, then if the true average treat, if the true average treatment effects, we're only getting an unbiased estimate of it, but if if the true average treatment effect is generally is greater than zero, then you know that um, the, the treatment contributed to the outcome in at least some individuals in the treatment group. The average couldn't be greater than zero unless it did so, though you don't know which individual. So what you've actually established is a singular causal claim, but you don't know who the singular causal claim is about. So um, the much vaunted RCTs, only provide evidence that the treatment caused the effect for some individuals somewhere in the study population. They don't warrant any specific singular post hoc um, causal claims and clearly no singular predictions. 
but they do the only way they could establish singular predictions is if you join them with a lot of other stuff and for instance came up with a regularity which is what they're urging to do um, but what they do do okay uh, they don't warn any specific singular post hook or ex anti causal claims but they do establish singular causal claims it's just that you don't know for whom so i call them where's wally studies um, now, here's, my, here's a very, very simple-minded catalog of evidence types. Um, you get evidence for singular pr uh, prediction at the first tier um, of, of evidence types are the character of the cause and the effect, uh, facts about intermediaries, and facts about causal principles. So we're going to look at those. Sorry, the, the reason we go down to the second uh, tier is because if you want to know um, whether uh, the intermediaries um, are operating as they should um, to put um, you need to have you're going to need to know something about causal principles and that starts the whole thing over again so let's look here at the first tier for causal prediction um, the character of the cause vis-a-vis -vis the effect one of the nice things about this um, this <laughs> these um, types of evidence um, that appear both in my ex ante and my ex ante and ex post chart is that um, not only are they familiar from normal reasoning and in everyday life and in uh, the social and natural sciences, um, Bradford Hill had a famous uh, paper on symptoms of causality in medicine, and a lot of these are ones he'd isolated, so, but he doesn't explain why they're evidence, which is what I was. Uh, uh, um, so the character of the cause vis a vis the effect. Um, will the cause and effect occur at the time in the manner and of the size to be expected if it is to cause the effect at the time in the manner and of the size that's to be expected if C is to cause it? So um, a second question that we get evidence to answer is the presence of intermediate steps. Uh, almost all of these uh, policy regimes um, are connected by a number of intermediate steps. Uh, there's nothing about deworming. Uh, that is supposed to that you know directly deworming doesn't have a direct power to improve reading as it was supposed to have done in, in the famous Kenyan study uh, that triggered off the deworm the world movement. Um, it, you know it does so by a series of intermediary steps. You deworm the kids; they <clears throat> um, they're healthier. Uh, they're healthier. They're um, able to go to school, they do go to school. Um, moreover, they're healthier, so they're cl they're more attentive when in their school. Um, their reading scores, if they're getting good teaching, their reading scores go up. So the intermediate steps um, are, are all uh, very crucial there. Okay, so um, you have to identify what to, to pr start providing evidence that the policy is going to work here. Identify what intermediate stages are need need to occur and then provide evidence that they can or are likely to occur or not. And any evidence to that effect is evidence either in support or against the prediction. And then the third, uh, the first level are causal principles. Um, I, and this is where I was talking about uh, not high level theory, but um, identify low level or what middle level causal principles um, of a kind that um, uh, are expressed in the language of generics. Uh, people respond to incentives. Um, skill loss during periods of unemployment can um, be conducive to continuing high levels of unemployment, uh, principles like that. And I think it's really important that um, all that hard won economic knowledge that you do in quantitative models can actually also be just exported in the form of these generic causal principles. Um, ca conditional cash transfers um, use, among other principles, the pr principle that labeling a good uh, increases the salience of it even um, in before you uh, start um, offering uh, any um, in further incentives. So causal principles, you have to identify under what principle each stage is to produce the next. So the assumption is that um, you know, causal causation doesn't happen willy-nilly. It usually happens under um, a, a, a causal principle. And, and if you're going to argue that your, your initial intervention is going to produce the desired effect, you ought to be, you ought to be laying out the intermediate steps, the causal principles under which each of those steps is supposed to be able to occur. 
<clears throat> okay, uh, that there are or are not credible causal principles for each stage is good evidence for or against the prediction. Okay, now let's look at the second tier I've got down here. Uh, moderator supports absence of derailers and absence of safeguards. Those are all called uh, moderators. You probably all know this, um, but let's just look at um, what epidemiologists call PIs. Um, so uh, generally the idea is um, the same effect, same kind of effect can be brought about by um, a number of different processes or be contributed to independently by a number of different processes. But it, it, within each of those uh, separate ways of uh, contributing to the effect, um, there will be a sort of salient cause like assigning homework, but assigning homework doesn't work unless um, a lot of other uh, support factors are there, student motivation, et cetera. Um, there's an absence of derailers uh, that uh, could uh, could just stop the uh, <clears throat> the cause producing its effect, um, and then sometimes the presence of safeguards against those derailers. So uh, in conditional cash transfers, sometimes the idea is that a derailer would be the um, the parents accept the, uh, the money intending to send their children to school, but then given the temptation spending, that's a derailer, and whether it's a, 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 a correct one or not, uh, safeguards against that or often uh, give the money to the mother because the thought is that she's more likely not to give into temptation spending. Um, whether that's co co a correct strategy or not, I mean, that's an illustration of something where um, in order to um, get the uh, to get the intervention to work, um, derail, uh, safeguards were indeed put in place or what were taken to be safeguards. So uh, what I want to stress is the uh, the facts about causal principles and moderators. Uh, causal principles are key to identifying moderators. So there's a nice example uh, by uh, Paulson and Tilly of uh, uh, CCT installing CCTV cameras, um, reducing car theft in parking lots. Um, and they ask, well, under what causal principle does that happen? Um, is the causal principle that uh, the thieves uh, are afraid of being caught, and so they don't try to steal the cars um, in that parking lot? Or is it rather that the um, what's happening is that the CCTV cameras are being monitored by the police, and the police um, uh, dash out and arrest the thieves? So those are two different causal principles that you know people fear being um, <laughs> people fear being caught and punished, and um, <clears throat> The um, a, a, a quick response uh, can get you there in time. Those two different causal principles, which one of them is at work? It makes a big difference because if the first one is at work, you want the CCTV cameras to be very visible. And if the second one is at work, you want them to be um, invisible. Um, okay, so what the support factors uh, for the installing CCTV cameras will depend very much on the what causal principle, under what causal principles, the effects are supposed to be being produced. So evidence that requisite support factors are present or absent as required is evidence for or against the prediction. And you help figure out what those requisite support factors are by looking to the causal principles. Okay. So now let me tell you about very quickly, potential outcome equations and scams. Um, Mackey, Philosopher Mackey said what we just talked about, singular causes are inus conditions, insufficient but necessary parts of unnecessary but sufficient conditions. So um, then we have the effect on the left and the salient cause or treatment here. These are the support factors and this is a possible um, uh, additional, um, usually it could be a, a, a constant, okay. So, um, the, 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 this is um, what um, Mackey said about you know, the way we should think about any particular, the production of any particular effect. Uh, those are the moderators, okay. Now, potential outcome equations, if you look at the potential outcome equation, um, it's just a version of um, one of these um, Mackey equations. So I wanna expand on potential outcome equations um, and take, um, equations that are for the causes of the causes and for the effects of the causes and for the effects of the effects. I've really truncated this quite a lot uh, to make it easier because after all, 
um, this A's, these A's are themselves variables, they're moderator factors, and they will have causes and effects. Okay? Um, and also they're time ordered, sorry, X1 precedes X2, X2 precedes X3. Of course, you might have a number of things that all occur simultaneously. And so they would be on the top line. Uh, as you go down, every variable uh, lower is uh, a, at a later time. Uh, so uh, the, the, pic the picture I've got here is a, sort of gives you a triangular array uh, if you do it more complicatedly uh, with uh, lots of other factors that can occur at the same time. You get block triangles. Um, and if you start putting in the causes and the effects of these A's, the, it just gets complicated looking, but it's, per I mean, it's absolutely perfectly straight simple. So each equation gives the direct causes relative to a time slicing. The outcome that we were interested in um, could be anywhere because we might be interested in, um, you know, um, we might have particularly if you're doing post-oak analysis, you might be uh, get evidence of the effects of the effects. So cause C could be anywhere too, say X2. The scam is richer than the single potential outcome equation. It represents causes of causes. So causes of, so causes of intermediaries, causes of moderators, causes of derailers, plus further effects. Uh, the, the potential outcome equation collapses the scam and it loses, then uses useful information. So, you know, it goes, it just tells you uh, how that relates the cause in question to the effect in question and loses all this other additional information. Now, why the evidence described is evidence, getting to that quickly. So here we have the chart again. Okay. The point of the scam is that it is supposed that the real causal possibilities for this individual case are represented in a scam. That's just what the potential outcome equations uh, assume. Each of these types of evidence helps establish something about a feature in the scam that's relevant to the existence of a causal pathway from C to E or X to Y. And that's why they count as evidence. Okay, we can gather such evidence to aid prediction and we can show why it is evidence. That's what I like. Uh, a couple quick examples, character, the cause and the effect. Oops, sorry. <laughs> um, will X2 contribute to X4? The scam variables have time indices and have sizes. We can have good reasons for these equations. And given the real causal possibilities estimated in the scam, can the required size and time relations actually obtain? Um, cause and effect characteristics of one of the Bradford, Bradford Hill symptoms of causality. So what you should do is gather evidence about whether the moderating factors represented in, say, A32, A42, and A43, which have got to do with whether or not X2 can, uh, there's a causal pathway from X2 to X4, uh, gather evidence about whether the moderating factors can have the right size at the right time to ensure that uh, uh, X4, the required size at the required time, given the size and timing of X2. The other one is intermediaries. Um, so X2 in this, uh, uh, this set of causal possibilities, X2 uh, can contribute to, may or may not be able to contribute to X3 and X3 to X4. What evidence is there that X2 can cause X3? I mean, this is our hypothesis about what the real causal possibilities are. Um, and, and we ought then to be able to gather evidence about whether X2 can cause X3 and X3 can cause X4, contribute to. Um, to do that, you have to figure out under what causal principles. Okay? Um, if there's no causal principle that can under which X2 can contribute to X3, uh, then X2 really shouldn't be in the equation. We can say, let the A be zero then, but that, okay. So finding credible causal principles for each intermediary, each intermediary step is crucial evidence for the prediction. And we need evidence that there is a principle that can operate. And recall the principle then helps determine the moderators. So the right moderators also, um, uh, we ought to have evidence that the right moderators of the right size will be present. So schemes play a vital role in evidencing singular causal claims. They show us just what needs to be evidence for a credible prediction. And they provide a principled argument that features from my catalog are genuinely evidence for singular causal connections. So conclusion, we can have principled evidence for singular causal prediction, lots of it, and we can make warranted predictions about each role individually. Thank you.